Welcome to Untold Stories. I am Kevin McMillan. I am Brittany Williams. Untold Stories is a program geared towards reaching and encouraging young at risk youths through the sharing of motivational, inspirational, and relatable stories shared by persons throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Enjoy. Our guest today is Carrie James. Welcome to our program, Carrie James. Thank you. Okay, Carrie James. We have you here today to tell your story so you'll be heard. So, you can start from when you were a child, what you encounter, and remember it, this program is geared towards reaching out to youths, what you have in, went through, through your life, and how you overcome it, basically. That is what it is. Cause so, so, your story will be relatable to many youths out there, and it may reach many more, but you want, to know, you want them to know how the, you overcame your obstacles, and where you reach, and how much things you achieve by overcoming these obstacles. Well, first of all, um, thank you for having me. Um, I am a Trinidadian by descent. I, my father is Trinidadian. I was born in Grenada and I spent most of my childhood in Grenada. Um, at the tender age, when I was born, I was born with a hole in my heart. Uh. That's what we term. But what it basically is, is when you're oxygenated and your deoxygenated blood is flowing in the same valve. When the, um, I was one of the child that, you know, you thought would may not have had a normal childhood. And throughout my teenage, my um, childhood, you know, health was always a concern. And I was not always the healthiest child. And that was a significant burden on my family, specifically my mother, because I am the last of six boys and I grew up in a single parent family in a small rural village of Sanko in the parish of St. George's, Grenada. Um, at a tender age, life was very hard. It was a struggle and for me, my struggle started with a struggle for life. Wow. You know, because at that point in time, in the 1990s, a child born with a hole in his heart from a poor family like mine's the rare, it was a rare thing for that person to survive. Okay. You know, and I want to say thank God to my mother and the Grenada Heart Foundation who really pushed and assisted my mom in getting me to go to the U.S. to get that surgery done. Okay. Um, I think for me, one of the focal points or what is the most salient thing for me throughout my life has been defying the odds. You know, um, for one, it was thought that, you know, a lot of activities, physical activities that I would have engaged in, I may not have been able to do so because of my medical condition. And I remember in primary school, you know, um, I used to be abused by the, teach by the teachers, one specifically, and I remember on numerous occasions, my mom would tell the principal to tell the teacher do not hit him in his back, you know, because of his heart condition and stuff. And it continued unabated for quite a while. You know, and I used to be in and out of hospital, you know, sometimes there have been time in the night, you know, I just get up and I feel bad and they had to rush me to the hospital, you know, and it was, it had been a struggle. You know, um, also being poor, as I said, there's two types of poverty. There's relative and absolute poverty. Yeah. And I, we fall into the absolute poverty case. You know, we was the poorest family in the community. We lived in a house that was so dilapidated, you could have pulled us out from outside. The roofs were so bad that Almost every week we had to put flash ban on the roof. And even when the flash ban didn't work, you had to have containers inside for when rain falls to catch the water. Yeah. It was that bad. Then there was a hole in the, in the house and a big hole in the, fo in the flooring. And I remember on numerous occasions my mom would have sprained her leg in that hole. You know, so it had been very, very tough during those periods. Also, um, being the last child, you know, it, it was not as bad for me in terms of the siblings. probably how my mom would have related to my siblings. Uh -huh. However, it was really tough for us, you know. We, during primary school, we had times we didn't have food to go to eat. And we would stay home from school. Now, remember, the principal at the time would have told my mother, send them to school even though they didn't, you didn't have anything to give them. And we would have gone to school and we would have gotten the food in school, the school feeding program from the school feeding program. However, you know, when that principal left, she would have retired. It became difficult because 
I would say it was a form of discrimination from the person who took over. And I remember one time because they knew that we would be coming for the, for the food, she would stand in front of the door and she would call the register to see who is coming in and who paid and who didn't pay. So long as we saw her there, we know no food today. Uh, wow. You understand? And it was really tough. And one of the things I remembered, you know, so clearly is that at the end of the school term, I always used to be one or two before the last. And this report used to read, it was never because of a lack of ability, but was a lack of focus, right? And I mean, it was rough, you know, but there was probably something there because I remember not going to school and then go to school. When I, when I did in fact go to school, I could fit in a class and you will believe that I was there for the entire week. So then I just the first day I'm here. You know? So it was always something there, but it's just that we never capitalized on it. You know, um, I remember when I sat my first chance at common entrance, which we call SDA in Trinidad and Tobago, I failed. Yeah. And being coming from a family, I was the last, all my brothers and them would have never made it past that level. Okay. Right? Actually, I had one brother who got a scholarship to go to secondary school and he dropped out. You know? So for me, it was like I was just following the trend. Okay. You know, you come from a poor family, nobody believes you have any likelihood of success. And for me, that really made me see and understand something about myself that I didn't understand before. And one thing I, I learned is that I couldn't deal with failure. Uh -huh. And at that same point in time, one of the greatest, ins my, my greatest motivator and one of the person I hold the dearest in my heart, my late uncle, around that same point in time, he came into my life and he was everything that I wanted to be. Uh -huh. He had a nice house, he had a nice car. He was the first person I ever saw had a remote control car. We could have to start remotely. Okay. Right? And when he came, he used to come to the school, you know, he used to find what's going on with me. He used to pay for me to get the lunch. You know, and I was not able to get the lunch rather than having to wait until they oh. see the teacher there, you know, and stuff. And because of that, you know, I saw something that I wanted. I saw the type of person I wanted to be. Uh -huh. I want, at that point, I wanted to be somebody and I wanted to go somewhere. And within probably less than a year, I went from the bottom of the class to the first 10. Okay. Failing CXE from the one or two before the last to the first 10. And... Failing SEA? Yeah, well, sorry, SEA. Well, what we call common entrance. Yes. And I passed for secondary school. I didn't pass from a prestige school. Okay. Right? But before going to secondary school, my, my brother before me, because we were so poor, we used to have to get up like four or five o'clock in the morning and go in the, what we call like the forest. We used to call it the bush. In colloquial, in the local yes, parlance, yes. we say the bush. Yeah. And we'd have to go and get bamboo because our livelihood centered around making bamboo baskets. Okay. And at the tender age between 10, probably 9, no more than 13, mm. my brother and I used to go in the bush, as I say, the forest at the time. And we have to cut those bamboos. And if anyone knows that cutting bamboo is a very dangerous, dangerous thing. And these two, two, two little boys, you know, we go in there, so then we're walking in the bush, the bush above our heads. We have to be parting our way. Uh -huh. And we'll have to cut those bamboos, sometimes 20 foot long, uh -huh. sometimes three and four times our weight, and carry it home, and then get ready to go to school. Wow. Sometimes we went to school, you know, people will look at eat butter and cheese, and they might feel, you know, things hard for them. But and cheese is a luxury for us. Mm. We. Our mother, one of the constants, have always been there. And I know, I mean, I thank God for her. Because she made sure we eat. At that time, you know, we eaten and she didn't have any to eat. And we offer and she said, no, I can live on my fat. Just to make sure <laughs> that, yours, that her yes. children was fed. Wow. You know? But, but meat. 
Hold on. She's saying that, you know, how you used to feel. We used to feel, I mean, because we saw her not eating, we'll offer. You know, we'd say, Mommy, can't eat something. We'd beg her, and she would say no. You know? Meat was always a luxury for us, and it was never always part of our meals, you know? So a lot of the times, we would just have probably provision, or we would just have, you know, figs. So many other times, we only had mangoes. And, you know, I clearly remember being hungry so much that, you know, you get hunger, headache. And as a child, I didn't understand, you know, the pain I was in. And I remember lying on the floor in the veranda, and I wish I was dead. Wow. Because it was too much. Wow. You understand? So I just wanted to be dead at that point in time. But I thank God I didn't die, <laughs> you know, and I was able to persevere and, you know, come through. And right. but um, with all these distractions, you know, you, um, you're being hungry, cutting bamboo before you go to school, um, the, the things your mommy was doing, and you could have seen um, that she was sacrificing for you. Would that would you say that that led to um, to you being an being an achiever before SEA before which lead up to where you feel SEA? I agree. I mean, when you don't have the examples, you don't have the motivation, you're not seeing it in your community, you're not seeing it in your home, it is hard for you to see beyond what you know. Correct. Right? So for me, I just did, I just fit in. You know, I played. Education was not something that was, you know, taken serious. And one thing I could always remember, my mommy used to always push us, you know, take the education seriously. She used to make the sacrifice. You know, when we were in primary school, I mean, we used to try her best to get us the books, you know, and whatever equipment she could get. She used to do it out for her own self, you know. So, I mean, she tried her best, but then there was just not the motivation. There was, I mean, children learn by what they see. They follow what they see, yes. right? Correct. And that is why I said when my uncle came along, it played a very integral part in motivating me. Right. And there... You know, I start that couple with the fact that I failed the common entrance. Yeah. And now I see, and you know, like, you know, you see the light. Yeah. <laughs> you see yes. where you want to go. Yes, yes. Yes, you know, and it, it changed things for me, you know, and I so started. Life changed at yes, the moment. and I started to work hard. I started to take my education serious at that point in time, right. you know, and I went to secondary school, and it didn't, things was not a bell of roses, you know. I remember in Form 1, I was home for five days because I was sick. And my uncle, when he saw my report card, he said to me, he said, why were you home for that five days? And he said, and I told him I was sick with the cool and he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, the only time you should miss school is if you're sick and you can't walk. Right. From that day, I never miss a day of secondary school. Okay. Even when I didn't have to eat, I went. Uh -huh. When I didn't have money, I went. Hmm. So you understand? When the pants, I remember one time I was in secondary school and the pants were so tight it was like a leggings. And, you know, we didn't, I didn't have the money to purchase another one, neither did my mom had. You know, so I had to wear the pants for a while. And I mean, you know, people make fun of it, you know, and one of the focal points, one of the, what I say is that one of the things that have been a constant throughout my childhood is that I've always been bullied. Physically, verbally, emotionally, always been bullied. I have been called the most demeaning, nastiest names. You know, at the, point, at the point in time, I remember in Sudan, there was a lot of poverty and hunger because there was war. And, you know, when you're, when you're in children small, they would have stomach. And they used to tell me, oh, I look like a child from the Africa, I look like a child from Sudan, you know, you are alien, your head big, you're ugly. The nasty sort of things. And that happened from primary into secondary. In secondary, it's a comment total back. And you know what was the most one of the most amazing part of it? Even teachers did it. Wow. wow. They was not even sensitive to the ply to say, you know what, let me not do that. Right. You know, so with all of all the things that I was facing, I also had to deal with that. Yeah. And knowing that it came from people that you looked up to. Wow. One of the principal of one of the schools now, I remember calling me by nickname. Yeah. Right? Also, in secondary school, my grades was not always the best, you know, from, from one to from two, I was just average, you know, and I remember in from three, it really took off, you know, I started doing much better, but prior to that, you know, I remember before from three and from two, 
I remember I had nothing to eat and I went to school that day with six bottles of Kool-Aid water, brackish, barely sweetened. Mm. And that is what I had for the day. I remember the days when I didn't have anything to go to school, I would walk around the school so my friends or the people in my class would not see I have nothing to eat. Right. And I remember you have times, you know, before I go to school, the day before, mommy would say, Carrie, you know, I have nothing to give you. So you go stay home, you know, tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And I will get up and I will leave home before she even get up and go to school. Because I know if she get up before me and she see me home, she will tell me to go. Uh -huh. Because she didn't have any. But I went. And, you know, I remember from from three. That was the first time I came out in the first three in class. And from then I never looked back. Uh -huh. I became the person that had a vision. I wanted to be somebody even more. And I wanted to go somewhere. I remember in form four, in form five, I decided to myself, I want to come first. I've never been first in anything in my life, and I'm going to be first. I didn't make the first, though. <laughs> <laughs> I came second. By, the person who came first came, the mark difference was 0.01%. Uh. But what that taught me is that I can do anything I set I my I mind to. to. Wow. Yes. Very good. Right? So, so but, but at that time, that zero point one percent. You didn't think it was nepotism or anything. No, 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 no. I mean, the the girl who got the better mark, she have been a top performer from from one mm -hmm. to yeah, from but, five. But in your mind, that didn't exist. So nah, those things like this, it, that didn't exist to me because I mean, for me, if it was nepotism or if it was any form of discrimination, they would have never even given me. If I got in the first three or first five, uh -huh. they would not have done that. Yeah. Oh. Right? Sure. So it is what I earned, you All know? Right. But I mean, I really wanted to come first. I didn't feel any how towards the girl or anything, but as I said, it taught me a lesson about myself. It made me show that, you know what, I can do better. Yes. I can do good. I can be more than just all the dirty, all the bad names people call me, you know? Even all the my cricket team players, they used to call me all kind of names, all the, all the nicknames, but I went and I played cricket. Right. You understand? I was in the team. Nobody was going to stop me from doing what I liked. Uh, you understand? I wasn't giving up. Right. Okay. You understand? Even, I remember, and that is one of the things that always stay with me. I remember in secondary school, probably was about from three or from four. I went to school, I didn't have a shoes. I had a shoes, but the whole entire bottom of the shoes gone, and it was only the part of the toe in front that was there, yeah. on, almost on both sides. And literally, my foot was on the ground. And I remember one day walking out of the schoolyard, and the captain of the cricket team at the point in time, he say, "You know your foot on the ground, you know." I say, "You know what, boy? I have another one home, you know. I have another shoe home, but I want this one to done first. My fuck, the shoe was done. My foot was on the ground. Wow. Uh. My foot was on the ground, but I went to school. Right. You understand? I wanted to go. I wanted to learn." You understand? So, at that point in time in my life, I just wanted to set myself apart. You know, I remember talking about going to university in secondary school. Uh -huh. I mean, that was far-fetched. I come from a poor family. We struggling. I barely even have the means to go to school. But look at me there. Yeah. Talking about wanting to go to university. I remember that point in time, you know, um, one of the teachers asking me, in social studies, you know what you all want to be in thing. And at one point, I wanted to be I am political scientist. Actually, what I know political science, I knew I knew nothing, you know. And then I did in fact settle on wanting to be a lawyer, uh -huh. and this is really why I came to Trinidad, you know. And for me, when I left secondary school, well, actually before I left secondary school, when we passed common entrance, about ten of us went to the same school from the community. When I graduated from secondary school, I was the only one from the ten of us that went to the school together that graduated. Okay. In the community, there was only two of us that graduated in that same year, with me being one of them. Right? And then that really created a new history for my family because I was the first one in the six of us to graduate from secondary school. Yes. And I um, remember at that point, my uncle was moving back to Grenada uh -huh. from Antigua. And he would have spoke to me and he asked me, say, what are you going to do next? I said, I want to go to college. 
but I don't have the money to go. So I said, I'm going to get a job and I'm going to work and I'm going to save the money and I will go. He paid for me to go to college. Okay. My first semester in college, I returned a GPA of 1.67. I passed one out of the five courses. I could have seen, you know, my, he didn't make me feel bad or put me down. But, you know, um, could I see a form of disappointment, you know, that he wanted me to do better. But, you know, one of the things that happened that he gave me the encouragement. He motivated me. And at that point in time, I started living with him. And this was the first time in my life that I had a mother and a father under the same roof. Wow. Uh -huh. You know, this was the first time in my life worrying where the next meal came from was not an issue. Okay. This was the first time in my life I actually had someone dropping me to school and picking me up at times. Mm -hmm. You know, because from primary to secondary school, we walked to school. Uh -huh. Which is approximately a mile each. Both okay, ways. Okay. You know? So it was a lot easier then. You know, and I really thank God for him and for that. You know? So in spite of all the problems and adversity we have faced, you know, this at that point in time it was a lot diff a lot better for me. And in college, I remember on my first day of college and I went and signed up, there was one of the girls from the community and she and her group of friends, you know, like what are you doing here? You know, because she not come from a poor family. She know what, what it was like for us. You know, and, and I mean, it was like I was not supposed to be here. How dare you and nobody come here? But you know what? I went there. I didn't start off well. So I thought I had a GPA of 1.67. But at the end, I graduated. I didn't graduate with the best grade point average. You know, but I, my focus remained that I want to be an attorney at law. So at the end of the time, due to the fact that my father is a Trinidadian, I moved to Trinidad, and I got in my citizenship by descent, and I started a new journey in that I want to become a lawyer. I started living with relatives, and then I, start, I went on my own. The first place I went to live on my own is in Sawa. The house was not the best. Yeah. Right? I mean, it was, just, it was the roof, it was a concrete structure, and you know anybody could have passed even just climb up the wall and jump in, you know. Thing. And I remember at night, you hearing gunshot. So now I ask the landlord, you know, he said, "No, no, no, gunshot, I pipe bomb." I grew up in a community knowing what pipe bomb is, and I knew that was no pipe bomb, that was gunshot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I stayed there for eight months. Uh. I was on OJT, and. I remember wanting a new apartment, you know. At the same point, in time, I, I think I'm going to university. You know, and all of these things compete in demand, you know. And I remember that one day I was, you know, walking down these stairs. It was no stairs, it was just a truck. And then I was praying to God. And I said, God, I need a job. And I remember praying, you know, and asking God for getting me a, to get me a job I need a job you know because I want to get out of sour it wasn't safe you know and it's like you know walking down the stairs I hear I was like I heard a voice say to me you know what the job you need to learn to manage what you have now because when you get the better things or you get bigger things you would not know how to deal with it and within probably about a week or two I got a new apartment I mean, the people were so generous and kind to me. I got a fully furnished apartment at a little to no cost. Wow. Mm. You know, my, I mean, I still renting. So, with the OJT salary, with the stipend, not a salary, you know, I tried my best to save. And I would um, rent, you know, you had to pay to go to school. Not go to school at the time, but um, go to work and other things. And... I remember just after the OJT would have finished, I was unemployed at the point in time, and then my uncle came and he passed away. And because the, who my uncle was to me, you know, I felt that I really had to go back home and pay my last respect. Because for without him, I would not have had as half of what I had in terms of educational achievement. You know, and he really was the impetus and the push behind me to really take life serious, take education serious. You know, and, and I remember he actually, on the day in which he passed, 
I was supposed to start a new job at a law firm. And I was traveling with my landlord at the point in time going down to work and I got the message that he passed. And I just freaked out. You know, so when I went in the office, I would have told them and um, I would have started the job boy, three weeks later because I went, you know, and whatever little money I would have saved, I went and I took it and I said, you know what, I'm going home and I have to pay my last respects to my uncle because for him, I don't think I would have reached that far. And when I went home and I came back, I had to start over from scratch, you know, and I didn't mind. But that was, the, that was the first time I had to start from scratch. And there was many other times prior after that I start from scratch. You know, I'm here since 2011. So now I've been here nine years and I've started from scratch approximately four times. From being dead, broke, no money, yeah. and starting over. And when I came back, you know, I went to the job. I mean, it still wasn't water, wasn't paying no big star money, you know. And I went in, well... This is the same um, law firm job? Right. Okay. I was still working in the law firm. So they waited, so they waited, they the job for Yes, they yeah. did. And I thank yeah. God for that, yeah. you know. And I started the job and I worked, you know, and I, I remember it was really tough. The salary was under 4000 okay. And I still man, pay my rent, travel to work and stuff, and I still managed to save something out of that. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I remember at that point in time, I now decided, you know what, I get the apartment a little bit comfortable, you know, I want to go to university. So just before I started the law firm, I would have finished my OJT contract. contract. And little did I, I didn't really pay attention to the, to the terms of the condition that the last month you would not get paid until eight weeks later. In my last month on the OJG contract, I didn't really pay that attention to the terms and conditions where they say the last month you will, be, you will get your salary, your stipend, eight weeks later. So now I was placed in a position where I was now unemployed and whatever money I had saved, I take it and I paid my rent three months in advance. And I mean, I was unemployed for a while. And I then again, that was, I probably, that was my first time I start from scratch, okay. you know. But at the same time, I wanted to start, you know, to go to university. So I was start thinking about, you know, planning and stuff. So I remembered around the same time I got a job in a law firm. And around the same time, the first day of that job, my uncle passed away. Right? So after just having my first start over, he passed away. And I really felt that I needed to go home and pay some respects. You know, so I had um, some savings in Scotia Bank under the Scotia Life. And I had to go and close the policy and take the money and I went home. Okay. And, you know, I really felt that, you know, I really needed to do that because in that time since I came here, he passed away. In in um, March of 2016 and I've never been home yeah. Yeah. right I saw my after came in, after coming here I saw my mother about four years after yeah. right when she met me for the first time on the airport she told me she cried profusely yeah. people yeah. sat and watch you know like what going on here yeah. you know and it was really emotional you know because you know you have a child and you haven't seen that child wow. in four years yeah. you know and you know so it was rough you know but going back to when my uncle passed away and i went home it was my first time going home uh -huh. in grenada, grenada mm -hmm. since 2011. Okay. that was in march of 2016. and when i came back again that was and that was a new start for me all finances gone starting from scratch again. you know yeah. so the salary in the law firm was under four thousand dollars and now i'm renting and i still manage and you know, i try my best to save something uh -huh. you know yeah. because i say you know what i want to go to school then you know i try i went and applied for ue and i remember my first choice of applying for you i applied for international relations and I met the requirement because the requirement was that, you know, you have five subjects, you know, and stuff. So, 
In that whole process of applying for UWE, it was one around wrong. From the application process was horrible. I would have been to UWE just for the first application. I've been to UWE about 20 times. Back and forth, back and forth. And I was like, you know, like this thing seems so stressful. Yes. You're right. You know, not, like, you know what? But I was like, you know, you can't give up. This is something you have to do. You know, so I stood the course. When time for acceptance, I went to you. I didn't get no electronic acceptance because usually you send it by me. You, when you log in, yes, you're tracking yes. your application, yeah. you will see your acceptance Any letter. I, I didn't see nothing, so I went into you. When I, when I went in on the day they had listed for my faculty, they told me that I didn't get accepted because I didn't make the requirement. What they gave me was what they termed an advanced conditional offer. They said I didn't have maths. However, I, when I checked, I was like, you know, maths is not a requirement to do international relations, right? You can just ask for five O levels, you must have A levels, you know, or, or a certificate from a tertiary institution, which I had. Yeah. So I was like, you know, how is that possible? They, they, told, me, they told me that, um, yes, you may have made the requirement for the course, but you did not make the requirement for the faculty. Because the faculty requirement is that you must have maths. So I was like, how could the faculty requirement different for the requirement for a course? And I found it to be very frustrating. Now I decided, okay, well, now I'm going to embark on trying to complete the offer, the advanced conditional offer. One of the things was to go and do CXC over, and the other option was to do one of the UE introductory maths course. The cheaper for me was to do the introductory maths course. Right? So I went and I find out, you know, thing when it's offering, and for about a year, every time they have to send me the, the email, they're sending it late. Wow. Right? Until I keep going in. And when I went in and I pay, the first time I went in and I pay for the course, they even forget to send me the start. Oh. When the course starts. So I miss the start after I pay. So I got this, I got the, actually do the course right before I enter university in 2016. I got to do it in July, and I passed, and I entered university. You know, and prior to entering university, I was work, still working in the law firm. And I remember praying, and I said, God, I need a job that will offer me the flexibility to go to school. Because the job at the law firm, it was so, it, the demand of it may not have lent itself for me to do both. Yes. You know, and in truth and in fact, I got the job as a letter warden, and it really offered me that flexibility in going to school yeah. and I went you know and I mean I see the job it was taxing because you had to stand up in the sun or work in the sun probably for you know six hours or much, and then go to school in the evening and I did that for most of my academic life at UWE yeah. right um, but one of the things that I forget to say is that I didn't actually, I did criminology at UWE, but I didn't sign up to do criminology. I signed up to do international relations. And then after, I changed to criminology because I said it might be more applicable because I wanted to do law. Yeah. Know that I said earlier I wanted to do law. But however, with now with all my the difficulties, things didn't go as planned as when I, you know, this, when I came to Trinidad, you know. So I know how to change how I do things. I, yes, my goal is still set. I want to be an attorney at law. How am I going to get an act myself? How are you going to get there? Because if you go to study law at UWE, it is going to have to be full time. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I go to do it in the external program, I have to find at least 10K per semester for the tuition fee, and then you start to pay for the exams in pounds. Yes. I don't have that money. So I say, you know what? I'm going to do a degree, which I could do after work, and then when I finish that degree, I will work, and then I will save towards going to do my law degree. And which, I, which, which in fact, I'm still on the way to doing that. So, during university, you know, there have been numerous times. I mean, sorry, but I mean, prior to university, you know, there have been things that a lot of things happen. I've been unemployed. I've worked seven days a week. I've worked six days a week. And as I said, I've been unemployed at times. You know, when I started UWE, I mean, I started with the little ward and had a job, a secure job for two years. And... You know, during that two years, I made a lot of sacrifice. You know, I mean, I would, I would lack a lot of things to save. 
And you know, it's like God talked to me, you know, that you need to save. And I remember when, you know, they asked me, like, oh, you know, you, some of my from one of my coworkers saying, making disparaging comment, oh, you're stingy, you know, you're tight-handed. And I said, you know, I cannot operate and think like you all. I am here on my own. There's no member of my immediate family here with me. I do not have a mom or a dad who could give me anything. I have to plan and put things in place. I say, after this contract done, right? If I do get a job immediately, I have rent to pay, right? I have to, I have, I have to eat. I'm still going to school. What am I going to do? I have nobody to turn to. You understand? So then, I mean, I don't know however they take it, but they feel like, you know, you should be spending, you should be liming, you should be having a good time. I just could not do that. You understand? I had priorities. You want, you didn't want to I mean, I would have loved to have a good time. Yes. You know, I would have loved to be going to the movies, going party, going carnival. I just could not. Ah. You no, know, my priority and my focus is that I needed to complete this degree. Because I, I now understood that the only thing that was going to get me out of poverty is education. Yes. And right? you, how old are you now? At that, I am 30 now. But at that point in time, I was like, 25, just on 25. 25 years old, you knew what was your focus. Actually, from when I failed common entrance, I knew what I had to do. Right. Okay. That is what, that was the awakening. That was the awakening. I knew from then, sorry, things have to be done differently. Right. So from since 11 or 10. But that would have been, I mean, I would have started second or primary school late because of my condition. Right. So whereas children would probably have started earlier, I would have started a little bit later. Right. Right? So about 12, yes. You know, and so I said to myself, you know what? I tell them I can't do things like you all. Yeah. Uh -huh. You understand? So would you say that um, your, 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 your lifestyle or the, the, um, the pressures that they went through at a very young age contributed to you being um, so focused to save and, 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 you know, dedicated to saving? Yeah, that is so true. But one of the things that, that was also influenced me was that I am alone, right? I mean, um, when I started living with my relative, when I came, we had a falling out, so, you know, we wasn't really in contact. So I was literally on my own, okay. you know? And one of my greatest fear was that if I fall sick, I do not have no money to take care of myself because I have nobody to turn to. Okay. And I remember in truth and in fact, there was a time I fall sick and there was nobody to come. Hmm. Wow. There's nobody to bring no medication. So, Mr. James, that's cutting you short. If you have advice to give a person who is facing the same matter that you have been in, what would it be? I would say saving is important, planning is important, and being focused, being grounded, and having a focus on what you want to be and where you want to go. But, but James, saying that, right? And doing it, you, you you should be all too familiar with that. Of course, of course. And for me, I remember it wasn't just for me. I saying it. And prior to starting university, I said to myself firmly, I am going to do this. I am going. I'm not leaving Trinidad and Tobago unless I accomplish what I want, even if it means I die trying. Wow. Ah. And in spite of all my trials and tribulation, I said to myself. I am going to do this. I remember when I started UE, you know, people were thinking, why not join this service or join this job and stuff? I say, I'm not going to do anything that will make me have to stop this degree. I say, because I am going to complete this degree, in other words, by the hook or the crook. <laughs> yes. Of course. With what? First class honors. But even before that, you know, during UE, um, I didn't start it off on the best foot, you know, as an A student. My uh, first semester, I got um, two B minus and a B. Yeah. You know, and every semester after that, you know, I stopped. I, you know, improved, improved, improved. But one of the th things that happened is that after the little warden contract, the first two years had ended. I was unemployed for approximately nine months. All the money that I have went back into paying rent, going to school, school fees and stuff. So then again, that was another start over from scratch, yeah. right? In the middle of your degree. In the middle of my degree. Yeah. And you know what was key? What was very interesting in that? In the middle of that, in the middle of that crisis, 
because you know you're, you're thinking about you know where you, I, I want from for me it was that I never wanted to be put in a position where I can't pay my rent right and I never wanted to be put in a position where I have to beg or ask anybody for anything yeah. right so it was very emotionally stressful for me yeah. but those two semesters were my best performing semesters I ne in those two semesters I never got nothing less than an A minus so for the four courses, all those grades was A's and the lowest mark was an A minus. Wow. Right? So, so one of the things that I learned for myself in terms of adversity, I learned it pushed me even greater. Yeah. You know? I said to myself, no matter what, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Yes. You know? I remember when I started as at first the first goal was that I set myself I wanted graduated at GPA above three. Then I found out about you know the honors roll. I say I want to be on that honors roll at least once. I've been there multiple times. And I said I want to graduate with first class honors. If you realize you know the goals keep changing. Yes. Yeah. I want to graduate with first class honors and I did that. You know, um, I remember during you we too, people, you know, you have to say, you know, you have certain course hard, you know, and it's difficult. All the courses they would have told me that was hard. I went in there and I got A's. Wow. Because the work I put in for those courses is that I take what people say, you know, yeah. but I, I, I take it with a pinch of salt. Yeah. You understand? And because I have the mindset that they say it is harder because they would have done it before, yes. I know work harder at it. Yeah. Because... So for the, for one, then, so that make it just say, hey, let me mask my girl. Yeah, you know what I mean? I, I am not going to be the one of the statistics that fail a course because I already know who know that people say it hard. I'm yeah. going to go out there. I'm going there to win. Just as I would have told you in secondary school, I never came first, yeah. right? But I don't set my mind that, you know what, I'm going to try and come first. I didn't come first, but I did well. Yeah, and I came second. Yeah. You know, so by zero point point one. one. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, so you know, I mean, that is one of the focus, you know, thing. And I mean, I remember one of the most stressful and emotional thing for me, Yui, is that I did a course and they failed me. I got 21 out of 25 in the coursework, and then on the final mark, they gave me 21 out of 25. 21 out of 75. So I messaged one of my friend, you know, personal friend in Yui. And I ask her, I say, what grade do you get? Because I taught her all she needed to know to write the exam, and she got a B plus. Okay. How is it that I am going to end up with a F3? Hmm. I emailed the lecturer. I didn't get a response immediately. You know, I remember going to UE. And I talked to one of the lecturers in the same faculty with and actually, they actually co-lecture certain courses together. And you know what the man told me? Tell me? We don't make mistake. You fail the course. Because it's two separate entries and we can't make mistake with that. I've nothing, and in spite of all I've been through, humiliated me based on what he told me. Yeah. And I, to me, I thought that was one of the most insensitive thing that a lecturer could tell a student. Yeah. Even if you had to refer me, to consultation, which the actual the actual lecturer did, right? I would have said, okay, that is fair. But for you to tell me in front of your colleague that you I can um you all don't make make mistake and I failed the course, I found it very disrespectful. But I were, I didn't leave it like that because I know I could not fail that course. You know when um, we went to do the consultation, the actual day for the consultation, I went into the office. I see the lecturer rushing. He say, Miss um, calling the lady by her name. He say, the boy passed. Well, he didn't see me when he rushed to her. And he told her, you know, well, the person passed. What is the issue? And he showed me the paper. Then she said, look at the gentleman here. He showed me the paper. And on the paper, they made a mistake with my ID number. Oh. Right? Yeah. And I got the highest for in the course for that semester. Wow. wow. Right? Um, the course was out of 
the final exam was out of 75. And I believe I would have gotten like 70 out of the 75. So I know if I had accepted that you failed that course, yeah. I would have had to pay for that course. And another motivating factor is that I didn't have the money to pay for that course. Yeah. Right? You know? And I just want to, something that I left out, which I think is very important, and I need to say it, is that because I am a Trinidadian by descent, I'm entitled to the same rights as a normal Trinidadian. Yeah. And I would have made all the legal requirements before applying for gate. And I personally felt that I was being, I was being um, treated unfairly. When I went to the gate office I applied, I was told that I cannot get it. I said, why? She said, you need to prove that you lived in the country for three years continuously before you get the gate. So I said, look at my ID. I said, I got my ID in 2011, my passport in 2011. And my passport will show you that I've never left this country until 2016, right. only a couple months ago before applying, before applying. She said, that is not enough information. I went, I get all the places I would have worked, and thank God I kept the um, letters of appointment, right. the pay slip, and my new mercy at a high low at that point in time would have paid weekly, and I worked there for a year. So imagine I had all those hmm. pay slip there, okay. I would have worked at the Ministry of Health for three years because I would have worked for two years on um, as an OJT and I would have gotten one year contract. contract. And you know, I got that one year because I worked so well. I was punctual, you know, I was somebody they could depend on. And actually it wasn't even my supervisor that gave me the contract. It was, uh, was um, someone who just noticed the Absolutely. quality okay. of the person okay. and recommended. So I would have got all the pay slip, all my um, employment letters, all my performance appraisals, you know, I bought uh, my passports, because I have the two passports, I bought the both of them, you know, I even bought the Grenadian passport because when they actually certified that I was a citizen, they put a stamp on it, you know, so I even bring all of that, and you know, she was adamant that, you know, I didn't qualify still, so you know, it was like, you know, it have to go to the board and only the board can decide, so I was like, fair. You know, um, I waited and I waited for a response and I didn't get any. And then I went to visit the office. And when I went to visit the office, she told me that you're qualified and we were trying to call you and we couldn't get you. She said, um, your phone was going to voice me. And I was like, how is it going to voice me? The phone is working. Has yeah. email, has email, they could have contacted you? No, but then there was email. She could have emailed me. Right. right? And, you know, and I just, I just felt at that point that, I mean, they was doing all within their powers to not give it to me. Okay. You know, and... I remember prior to that, my aunt asked me, she said, if you don't get the gate, what are you going to do? And I told her, I said, if I don't get the gate, I am working, so I would have to pay on a monthly basis. Whatever money I would have saved, I would have known how to pay for the courses. And I would take the payment plan and pay every month, you know, because there was nothing that was going to stop me at this point in time, right? I don't set my mind that I am going to university, you know, and I've been here for too long. And I remember, you know, prior to this whole, before starting gate and stuff, you know, and when I'm applying for UE and, you know, being rejected and, well, not rejected, but given the advanced conditional offer, being unemployed, I felt like nothing was going right for me. You know, I remember you have times I walk in the street and tears flowing out of my eye uncontrollably. You know, so I just couldn't hold because I felt that, you know, like everything was going against me. You're unemployed. You don't know where you're going to get, you're going to get the money to pay rent. You don't know how you're going to feed. You're, you're, you're trying to get into school. You can't. And I just felt like everything was Words just, you. yeah, you know, I remember at times I just home there and I, and I mean, I just couldn't control it, wow. you know, you know, but one of the things I knew I always prayed, you know, and, you know, my mom and my late uncle wife, you know, they always encouraged me, they was always, uh, you know, but this hope. Is what I, this is what I want to know, at those points, low points in your life, what, you know, push you to, what pull you up, out of yeah. that, that, that. That you know, you can see state of depression yeah. in a way. You know, and actually that's a good question because I remember at some point it might have snapped myself back into it. God said you was not built to break. Uh, you understand? And I took that from one of them Whitney Houston songs. God, I was not built to break. Right. Why are you here? Why are you being feeling sorry for yourself? Get up and get. Uh, and I, by that, I renewed my focus and you know, I started applying for jobs. And I remember you have times being unemployed and I probably would have sent out 300 applications. Wow. Right? 
I mean, I was up and about a green oil ministry. Even when they, they don't have ads, I was applying. Wow. Even random companies, I would just do up application and drop it off. You know, and... But, I, but, but why did we know that? Um, would you say it was out of luck or it was um, discriminated against by, by, by you being at a, a, a born Trinbibulian? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. You know, because I think at probably at the times also, you know, the market was flooded with people. You know, because um, at that point in time, I remember, because even the reason why I would have left the Ministry of Health is that we was going through economic crisis in terms of the oil prices being dropped. And I was one of the staff they would have let go when the, ministry, when the government asked the ministries to cut spending by 7%. Okay. Right? So I was let off then, you know. And so I don't, think, I don't think that way. However, I would have faced some discrimination in certain places that I would have worked. You know, I've got a lot of disparaging coming by the mere fact that I was not born here. You know, that I'm, I'm my accent, you know, and stuff. And some people felt that, you know, I was taking away things from locals. Yeah. You know, but I, this, is what, this is what I was getting at, because you, want, you would have gone and be do interviews, and because of your accent and, you know, your, maybe you made your accent something from your background, mm -hmm. and then they realized that it was not, it was not, they didn't grow up in Trinidad and to be, go, oh, you're not, you know, that kind of way, yeah. they would have kind of shielded their people like oh this spot for their people like, you know that kind of way yeah clannish and actually i will not say that right <laughs> because the, the job that i got in the law firm one yeah. of the deciding factors for me getting that job is because i wasn't born here okay and the the, the, the the attorney clearly stated that right because when he saw my resume and he saw i was so qualified i mean i wouldn't it was no big qualification but i was over qualified for the job mm -hmm. and he said you want this job i said yes he said, but why would you want to job when you have all this qualification? I said, I, I want the job. I applied for it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I said, actually, one of the reasons why I want this job also is that I want to be an attorney in the future. And this would be a good way so to learn, to you yeah. know? And he gave me the job. And he told me that, you know, one of the reasons why I'm really giving you this job is because you are not a local. Wow. He said, because one of my ex, he said, my experience with local people, because the job is my experience, a, a little job, don't pay much. They don't do it to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm giving you the job, and that was the requirement. So I cannot say in that regard, in terms of getting a job, I've been discriminated. However, in actually being in jobs, I've been discriminated against. Oh, yeah. right. You know? And... So it was equal opportunity, but yes, why was there face yes. discrimination from the employees? From employees, and I cannot say that, you know, um, because I do not know what going into the decision of making and in selecting someone for a job. Right. I, I do not know that, so I cannot say that. However, I can say based on my experience on jobs, you know, Face yeah. And I remember also, um, I lost a job because I stood up for the right thing. Okay. You know, we was OJT at the point in time, and our supervisor at the time wanted us to stay in a building that had no electricity. And we stood up, you know, and we told them no. We told her no. And one of the days in which I didn't, we was trying to relate to her, you know, why we can't stay and, you know, stuff. And she was like, you know, I am making a management decision. I am making a management decision. And the next day I didn't come to because I was sick. That was the same time I was chicken gunia. Yeah. And when I didn't come to work, my two colleagues who was there at the time went to the OJT and reported her. So the next day I came to work, she had already promised me prior that, you know, she would recommend me for the position that I was actually performing as an OJT, you know. So the next day I came to work, I was calling the office and told what transpired. Me with my honest self, I'm going to tell the lady, I said, well, ma'am, you was wrong. I said, because the day, be the two days ago, when I was here, we was trying to explain to you the situation and you was not entertaining us. I said, you just keep saying you're making a management decision, a management decision. But we were trying to explain to you, mind you, she did not treat other senior staff members like that and force them to stay in that building. Mm -hmm. But the OJTs wanted us to force us to stay in the to building stay. without no electricity. And I stood for what was the right thing. I told her, I said, no, I said, you was wrong. And you know what? I didn't get the contract. I was told that I was disrespectful. Mm. I was rude. For stand up That's for writing. Standing up for yourself. Not just well, for me. For the because right. I wasn't there when what transpired. Right. But what I, I told her, she was wrong. Right. And I could not have told her otherwise. Mm -hmm. It was I mean I would have I cannot roll these two OJT under the bus for, for what? A job? Hmm. I mean it was not within me. So I stood up for the writing and to date, 
Yes, it may have made my life a lot easier because the job would have been a, a reasonably paying job. You know, it would have been a contract for a good period of time. Yeah. However, I am happy with myself and I'm content that I stood for the writing and I didn't put my colleagues in a position where they would have been disenfranchised. So to, to yes, yes, I was not going to do that. And anyone know me, right? And who have worked with me, been to school with me, know that when it comes to those things, yes, don't yes, expect yes, me yes. to roll That's over scary. for you. <laughs> 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 you know? And I always try my, my best, always try my best to do what is the right thing and to do what is the honorable thing and always keep my actions and behavior within the parameters of the law. All right. So what's the next step now, seeing that you, you accomplished this big achievement here, first class honors? Sir? You know, actually it's not just um, graduating with first class honors. I am one of the first, I actually first male graduate from my university, graduate from my community, uh -huh. the first in my immediate family, uh -huh. right, and one of the first in my community, uh -huh. right, so it is not, this success is not just, you know, for me in terms of, you know, hey, you do accomplish something good, for me, I see an accomplishment for my family, uh -huh. from being one of the, the poorest, actually the poorest family in the community, to produce one of the first, produce the first university graduate, it's a big accomplishment. Yes. Yes, yes. You know, and I remember, chance. thank you, and I remember when I passed for secondary school, one of my neighbors made a step and oh, and he, he got drop right before he reached from three. You see, one of the men make it. Hmm. Well, you know what? I can't say I make it. Right. I haven't made it, <laughs> but I am on the way. Uh, and I am going to make it. And you uh, will make it. But do you, do you pass yeah, it because you say you have a job before form yeah. three? Yes. But what I but mean? you go on to another chapter, but yes. you chapter done. Yeah. That, that chapter and is... you keep climbing. You keep yes. Yes. So you pass it. Yes. Yes. Just you go on to new You're going adventure. You're going more. Yes. 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 So you you pass our expectations. Yes. Yeah. Well, it was not her, but it was a him. A uh, him. Mr. James, next five years, will you see yourself from here? Well, um, I recently started a job in the judiciary, I started to work at the judiciary. Um, I want to do that job for a while. However, in the, five, in the next five years, I want to start law school. I want to, you know, start my LLB in law, and then I would like to, you know, go on to do my LEC because my ultimate goal is to be an attorney. As I would have said previously, though I may have um, digressed a little. I, that goal and that my purpose and comment of that have not changed. Right. And I am still, that is still my ultimate goal and I'm going to remain focused in attaining that. And I actually one of, them, I think one of my greatest strengths, which could probably be my greatest demise, is that um, I'm very stubborn when I set my mind towards something, right? When I do that, nobody or nothing is going stop to stop you. me. Good mindset. <laughs> right? And I think, um, Sometimes you have to learn how to channel your neg sometimes something negative into a positive. Yes. You know, and some people might say being stubborn might be a bad thing, but I am using that towards, you know, yeah, the positive yeah. because, yes. yes. You know, in facing many things, many trials, you know, I mean, I remember applying for jobs and people say, you know, what are you applying for this job for, you know? And I, and I mean, I continue to knock on those that they say I, I should not knock on. Uh -huh. You understand? Right. Breaking down barriers. Breaking down barriers. I remember when I got a certain certain job, they asked me, how you get that job? Who you know? Mm -hmm. I ain't know nobody. You understand? I keep knocking on doors. I keep pushing, you know, and I keep going forward. And I remember when I told one of my friends that I got a job in the judiciary, they turned around and they made a statement, oh, look at how you come here and you're doing better than some of us are born here. Wow. And I know he didn't mean it in a bad way, but I turned around and I told him, I said, Nobody gave me this job. I said I applied for it and I believe that I got it because I earned it. Wow. I said I paid my dues. I said I went to school. I worked while I went to school. I worked seven days a week at times. I worked six days a week at times. There was time I had no job. And I went to school. Right? So I didn't, I didn't, to, for to him, he may seem it as you know, I come here and I'm you know, getting, I'm doing better than locals. Yes. But I work hard. You understand? I never gave up. You know, and um, as I told the gentleman, I said, look at how our own uh, locals, when we go to countries like the US and the UK, yes. how hard we work. Yeah. work yeah. You know, I'm just doing the same thing, but I'm just doing it in Trinidad. Okay. Right. You know, and as I told him, I said, one of the reasons that I always continue to encourage you is because I see myself as a young man, probably would have been in the same way if I didn't have the focus. Right you know, to work hard and to push. Yes. 
you know so um in the next five years i just gotta have the health and strength and have the life but you we here i come i will be knocking on the doors no. to enter and the llb in law yeah. Yeah. and then you wouldn't i will be coming you know and i'm i'm going to continue to do this you know i'm going to continue to push the barriers yes. you understand and i think um for me one of the in doing that helping and the whole purpose of this interview or you know this program is to help motivate young people yes and i remember when i grad, when i finished when i completed my degree i would have posted a copy of my certificate online and i would have given a little synopsis of my history you know and my nephew who would have dropped out of secondary school he posted that you know i never knew you went through so much and i never knew half of what you went through but i am going to go back to school wow. because i want to follow you mm. Yeah. And to me, in all of this, this is the greatest accomplishment yes. for me. Uh -huh. That the intent, that imposing that was that I could help motivate somebody, motivate help yeah. encourage somebody. Yeah. And you know what? It started within my own family. Right. Right? You know, um, I remember many people were saying, you know, you should be very proud of yourself. But when I completed my degree, I was not proud. I was humbled. Uh -huh. Why was I humbled? It's because where I came from, right? And to where I am today. I considered going to university a blessing. I was not privileged. It's a privilege. It wasn't something that I had to do or I was supposed to get. Yeah. You understand? But for me, it was a blessing. Yeah. And the mere fact that I was able to go there. And for me, every day I went to UE, every class, probably every lecture would remember me because I would contribute. Right? right? Because I so wanted to be there. Because to me, that is the... I mean, most people complain about university, you know, being hard yeah. assignment and stuff. But for me, I embraced it. Yes. Because every day I saw it as a blessing, as a privilege to be there. Mm -hmm. You know? But, that, but something you just said, right? Um, in posting your message on Facebook, they never reached out to you and told you that you want to go back to school. Yeah. But wasn't your uncle, was he want to encourage you? Yes. So it come like history repeats itself, history right? History repeats itself. You know, and that is what actually. I saw that, you know, and I'm, is a, I'm happy that you brought it up. And it's actually the same thing, you know, history repeating itself. Yeah. And I'm happy for that, you know, because as I said you know, earlier on, I mean, it is every, to me, the whole intent in posting that message on Facebook was that I hoped that someone would see it and it will motivate them. Right. It will help them to get from wherever they are uh -huh. to the next level. But this is what this program is about, Untold Stories. Yes. And this, I am glad that you brought it up. But the thing about it, right, it has so much negative di di um, distractions out there for youths now that it is hard to, it's hard to sift through all that to find positive things. If you watch the news, is, is negativity. The music is negativity. The, um, the movies, you know, the, the, the things people say about certain actress areas, you know, nothing good is coming out of these areas, you know, and you come join the area part you come from Grenada, right it was at risk area um community and you know a poor community come over here where you find yourself in, <laughs> in, in impoverished communities yourself because they can't really go and pay for west morins right. or, or the glencoe or palmas so you find yourself in these same areas and still excel and even to uh, although it was even harder for you because as you say um at the end of the day we have our support whether it be auntie something we have a support you here by yourself how, how that how that impacted on you to really, you know, excel because there would have been so much distractions. Of course, you know, um, in actually, remember as I told you, I, I started living with a relative first, you know, and then I went on my own. But for me, when I came here, and as I would have said before, that I had came to the resolved that I am not leaving unless I get what I came for. And I used to be a lawyer. Right. Okay, I'm lawyer, lawyer, look at I mean, for now, I, as I say, I'm, I would love to practice in about, you know, most likely the civil and probably the criminal division, you know. I'm actually going to, when I'm starting the judiciary, I will actually um, work in the, fam, in the children and family oh, court, you know. Yeah. And, I, and probably that experience in itself might change my whole perception or my view on what type of law I want to practice okay. in, you know. But I'm actually going to embrace that, you know. But, um... Going back to your question, in terms of, you know, 
what kept me focused you know not having anyone you know in terms of immediate family yeah is that i knew that my family is going to look up to me to, as you know they say a leopard changes stripes you know to change the f not just the fate but the image the perception of our family That's so it was not just you know the financial stuff i thought about you know how my mother would feel and my mother will always she always talk about you know feeling as you know miss peacock you know when you graduate and stuff you know i mean all my father never really played an integral part in my life you know when he he's one that always boasts about you know his son in university you know and I know that that accomplishment is going to make a lot of them feel good. Yes. So for me, it was never just about, you know, me alone. You know, it was about my family. It was always about, you know, the people who would hear about the story and, you know, who would know about me and who I hope to motivate. And, you know, one of the things that I always, you know, have always been in my heart to do is to do motivational speaking. You know, I want to be able to help, you know, young people. I mean, and I have lived in Toronto long enough to see that, you know, there are a lot of disparaging comments about young black boys, you know. And uh, as I said that, it, it brought me back to a situation. I remember the first time I went to Arima for myself being in Trinidad. And I, I went out there with my naive self and everyone I see, no, good morning. And everyone was looking at me. And I remember seeing someone who was not of my own ethnicity. And when they saw me, they clutched their bag. And it really struck, hit home to me. You and know? when I went back home, I told my aunt. And she said to me, welcome to Trinidad. Hmm. However, that have not been the prevailing experience. That have not been, you know, my experience with everyone. Some of my best friends, some people that helped me the most in my time in Trinidad, have not been people of my own ethnicity, you know. But... To me, it really showed me what a lot of our own young men face. The mere sight of me caused her to, you know, to hold the clutchy bag. Mind you, I was not, I didn't look like my band. I, mean, I was properly, you know, attired, you know, well-groomed. And that really struck me, you know. And I'm saying this because that is what I want to do. I want to be able to help young men, you know. So let us break the barrier. Let us break the perception that we all are. Change the label. Yes, let us change the label. Let us, you know, make people see that we are not just criminals. We are not what, you know, people perceive us to be in a negative light. This bit brings me to my next question, whereas, um, what advice you have for young black men? Because right now we're losing the battle. As you could see that um, we graduated, and in UE, and you, you could see that we are underrepresented in UE because when they watch at UE graduation, it's mostly women. Right. And we, as in ourselves, as, as, as young black males, we are underrepresented tremendously. Yeah. What would you tell these young black men? What I, would, what I would say, not just to the young black men, but to the black fathers, yeah. to the black mothers, yes. step up. Oh. Right? I know it have a, uh, from my experience, you know, and a lot of them settle for less because they believe Luka. that, you know, the system is against them. They believe that, you know, this is not for me. They believe that, you know, I should only attain this, le this level, you know, and I shouldn't go further. Yeah. Parents need to step up. Help Would emancipate yeah. their mind. Yes. Help push them. Don't set no barriers or goals for them. Let them decide. Let them see that the world is theirs. Yeah. You understand? And for me, nobody didn't have to tell me that. The mere fact that, you know, I realize that, you know what, I want to be somebody and go somewhere. But not everybody have that in them. That will power. Well, that will power. And I'm saying to parents, step up. You understand? <laughs> if you know your child is doing something wrong, set them straight. Yeah. Don't sugarcoat it. That's you understand? And you must push your children in the right direction. Nothing is ever too great for them. Nothing. You should let them believe or have the perception that there, you, there's a limit to what you could accomplish. There's a limit to who you can be. No, that's not the case. Uh, and and uh, uh, what you're saying, right, it, it kind of just um, jolts my memory a little bit. Whereas um, the glorifying of the, of, the, of the negative things, you know, um, Certain people that they, they, they speak about, and this person is, is not a person to look up to. 
but they right. glorify that person right. and these young people in the, in the community will look up to this person why it is have no, they have, don't have more men like you and i or other men who stand up positive who will be on this on this show you understand reaching out to these children why i think um so i think sometimes it's not it's not that there's not people who are trying to reach out to them you know but i think sometimes it's the way in which we try to reach out to them right i mean for example you might reach out to somebody but you might give them things you do not teach them how to get it so reaching out to someone is one thing but how you do it it must be done systematically right i remember one of the things my uncle telling me is that the only greatest thing i could give you is an education and why is that why why he told me that was that because he knew that education was the only thing that was going to get me out of poverty and i remember he's making this statement and saying that he have three children and making the statement that the only thing i can give my children is a good education so when i leave this world i would have given them something that nobody could take from them because if i give them material things or i give them properties they could lose it but what is inside here cannot be lost right so to me yes we need a positive image out there for, for people but we need to teach them how to get to those positive images and how to make yourself a positive image. And being a positive image is not just to show someone, but you must be able to go and tell them, you know, how. Right? Because as the, the old proverbial saying, you teach a man how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime, but if you give him fish, you only feed him for a day. Yes. And we need things that is sustainable. And we need to help them in a sustainable way. We don't need. We don't just need to show them what is glad, you know, what is good and stuff. Then we help them and show them the way. So for me, when I, I start, my, you know, start and I really get into my motivational speaking, what I want them to do is that use my life as an example to show them. You know what? It doesn't matter where you come from, but if with hard work, with the proper mindset, you know, with remaining focused. And one thing also, we're also keeping God in mind. You know, no matter what religion you come from, always keep whatever God you, you believe in yes. at the epicenter of everything. And I totally agree with you, Mr. James. And at that time, which one of the achievements were you the most proud of achieving? You know, most people would expect me to say, you know, accomplishing degree degree was the most important. But I think for me, one of the things that brings me the greatest joy is when my nephew wrote that because of my accomplishment, he's going to go back to school. And the last time I spoke to him, he was actually doing classes. Brings me the greatest joy. So you just by posting that on social media, that, that way we could say it have the good and the bad due to social media, you motivate him and also probably millions that you're not even aware of. Well, I hope that is the case. And I, <laughs> I hope that, you know, as I said, I really hope that is the case. And I, if that do happen, I want to say to these people, the, the journey has now begun. Yeah. It is going to get rough. It's going to be tough. But failure is never an option. Yeah. Giving up, never an option. You might have to cry. As the old people that say, you have to suck salt, but suck it. Yes. Cry. Yes. Fight. Knock on those that tell you that not, you're not supposed to knock on. But at the end of the day, make sure you get to where you want to go. Yes. Yes. And I'm not telling nobody to go in to get themselves involved in any illegal activity. Wow. But persevere. Yes. You understand? Yeah. When, they say, when they say no to you, when they make this paraging comments about you and what you feel or what you think you're doing or what you're trying, use that. Just as how Vika use fuel, that is your fuel yes. to keep going. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Wow. You understand? And when I look at everything that probably I would have faced in my life, I want to say to people, one of the most important things is that be careful of what you say to someone. As you would know, um, you know, the labeling theory, yeah. you know, and how the impact of labels can have on people, cool. right? Had I internalized the negative label of the people in my community, I would not have been here today. No, I've been saying internalized, no. 
accept it. Right. Well, I mean, internalize, you accept, accept it, it. Yeah. right? And you act upon it, right? I would not have been here today. But, but for me, I wanted to, to prove them wrong. Sorry. Right? But for a lot of young people out there, they're not strong. They don't have that mental, that willpower. So I'm saying to people out there, be careful of what you see. I mean, to the teachers and them in, my, in secondary school who would have called me by nicknames and stuff. You know, and they may not have known that while I was in Grenada, I had no form of self-esteem. I will do things I want to do, right? I was strong mentally and emotionally. But deep down, I would have never thought my, look, of my, look at myself as someone who was beautiful or handsome. I never look at myself that way because nobody saw me that way. Right? But, as I was saying, be careful of what you say to people. Not everybody might have been mentally and emotionally strong as me. Yeah. And by you saying these things, the people could push them down. Yeah. Right? I mean, it have a serious psychological effect on them. You know, a lot of the times that people would post certain things and you might, they might um, attribute their success to something someone might say to them. Right? Or a teacher. Mm -hmm. Or a principal. Or a friend. Or a neighbor. Yeah. Someone they look up to and might have a positive um, meaning to them. Yeah. And it would influence them. So I'm saying to them, people in authority, people who, who are an adults, who your, your words could affect young people. Be, be very careful, careful. Yeah. of what you say. And I remember how shortly while ago you alluded to the allure and the, the, the um, how should I put it, the positive image that people perceive that crime act be, um, have. And I'm actually, I teach criminology virtually, but well, one of a um, part of a course at the team I was a community college in Grenada where I would have been a um, okay. past student of. Uh -huh. I did part of that course and I remember actually having to go into that as one of the cause of crime. Mm -hmm. You know, that pause, how people see crime as being, you know, having that positive image, you know, the easy gains and stuff. Yeah. And I want to tell people, you know, especially young people, that is only short term. And it is an illusion because one day the luck going out. Yeah. You know, they were, they were saying, um, the longest hope of an end, yeah. Yeah. you're going to reach the end, right? So, to avoid that... And most of the end will be nice, it's exactly. either jail or six feet under. Yeah. And to avoid that, stay on the right path, do the right thing, try your best. There are going to be obstacles in your way, try your best to remain on the right path, you know? And I want to also say, because to me, and I always believe that the family and parents play an integral part yeah, yes. in who your child become and what your child become. And I do not, I mean, some people might say, you know, you have children, they might just, you know, be beyond control. But I'm going to say, yeah, right, but I'm going to say to the parents and to people out there, if you do your groundwork right, you set the right foundation, it's none of that will, be strong. will but happen. Mr. James, just sitting here and listening to your story, you motivating me and all. And I really want to tell you, thank you for that, right? And I've given you the opportunity to also tell everyone in the walks of your life. I mean, you might not be able to call out everybody's name. But at least you have the opportunity to thank them today, you know, to especially mommy. Right. Um, yes, I want to thank my mom. She has been one of my major supporters. And she would have been one of my greatest champion you know in championing me to move on because even you know she mean you know, she was there are times when she was not working you know and i was not working and she would have sent me things some grenada you know to help me and to help minimize my costs while going to school while not even having a lot for herself you know i want to thank my late uncle because i always remember him and i remember throughout my time in ue i never wrote an exam without remembering him and every time I wrote an exam, the reason why I remember him is because I said to myself, where I know that he's above looking down, and I want him to be proud at the results of this exam. And I also remember that, you know, a lot of times when I go into some of my problems, I remember him, and I ask myself, what would he have done placed in my circumstance? Right? You know, and then also not just thanking my uncle, my late uncle's wife, who is actually like a mother to me, and I thank God for her, you know, because um, 
now that my uncle is not here, you know, she have also been a, a major source of strength and motivation for me. You know, a lot of the times when I'm going through things, I could talk to her. And, it, and I mean, talking to my mother also, you know, she helps me a lot. You know, she's one of the persons that I really get my strength from. But also talking to my aunt, you know, who's like a mother for me, you know, sometimes it gives me a sense of calm. In, any mid, in the midst of any storm, yeah. you know, and I really thank her for that. My aunt, who would have um, assisted me, you know, while I was going to secondary school, would have provided me books, you know, and continue to be um, a motivator for me, continue to, you know, help me. And when I wasn't working, you know, they would give me little jobs, you know, or they would um, help me out. I really thank her for that. So my landlord, who would have been... You know, like my second parents, you know, I mean, they have been a second family to me, have helped me a lot. Thank you so very much. And to all the people who I've worked with, you know, um, from the Ministry of Health, you know, have always been, we have continued to be, remain friends today and have always been a supporter of me and uh, give me encouragement. Thank you. And for all those who I may have forgot to mention, you know, by name or by reference, I just want to say thank you to you all. Because, and all the people who have submitted disparaging comments and statements, I want to say thank you to you all too, because you helped put fuel to my fire to drive me forward. You know, and I just want to thank everyone. I'm not just grateful for the positive or the people who have helped me, but I'm also grateful for the people who would have also tried to contribute negatively, which I have turned into a positive. Yes. Right? So then you take all the, ne the negative comments and energy and turn it into positive for yourself. Everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly, and I... Uh, Channel it in the way I <laughs> want it. it. So you use know. it, use it in, in, for yourself. Yes. To push yourself forward. Yes. Positive. That is a yes. very, you know, that, that is something a rare talent. Because not everybody could deal with that. Eh? Yes. Not everybody could convert that energy into something positive, positive, negative to positive. So that's a very rare attribute that you have. And one of the things I always try to do is look for a solution rather than look at the problem. Something happened. What is my option? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? So you're looking at the glass half empty, you look at it half full. Oh, my goodness, full of glass. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> <laughs> what thing to um, carry, right? Um, does it have any, like, any codes that stay with you? Like, like for instance, my, one of my codes that I love um, is not the way you fall, it is in the way you rise. You understand? And I come from Martin Luther King. And my most important quote is, I was not built a brick. And the reason for that is I've been through many things and I have not broke. I have not given up and I have not conceded and I will continue to be a beacon of strength and hope for many people. So I was not built to break. Thank you, Mr. James, for coming on Untold Story and sharing your stories with us. We deeply appreciate it. It was my pleasure having you on Untold Stories. Thank you very much for having me. Not a problem. Thank you for viewing Untold Stories. My name is Carrie James and I would like to thank the team of Untold Stories for having me here. And I do hope that my story helped to motivate someone. And please subscribe to Visionary Productions.